Silver and gold had solid weeks and positive price action. Silver spot price appears to be closing at or just below the $16 an ounce level. The spot gold price rose about $20 over the week, closing near the $1,320 US dollar per troy ounce level. As mentioned last week, we have a returning guest who took time to discuss the ongoing proxy war ramp up in Venezuela. What does his former advisor, the 1990s president in Venezuela, have to say on the matter? Who are the proxy war players? What are their interests? How have seemingly endless sanctions by the Trump regime affected the intensifying situation? Other topics include our guest's actual policy prescriptions for failing fiat currency states, which he has implemented in the real world. He has a track record of success in this department. Is this merely Latin American U.S. imperialist policy ongoing? What's Russia thinking? We end this discussion covering larger picture China ahead. These topics and more after this brief message from our sponsor. SDBullion.com is a high volume physical gold, silver, and precious metal dealer. Founded in March 2012 with the goal of providing the lowest cost bullion available, SD Bullion has become one of the largest US based precious metal dealers and is regularly recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of America's fastest growing companies. At SDBullion.com, you can order your guaranteed physical precious metal bullion products online. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Discreet, low-cost delivery is both fast and always fully insured. We are committed to being your trusted source for low-cost, highest quality, investment-grade bullion products. Visit sdbullion.com for more information. Welcome to this week's Metals and Markets Wrap. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. With us this week, a returning guest, Professor Steve Hankey, co-director of John Hopkins Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health and Study of Business Enterprise. Hey, Professor, thank you for coming back on our show. Good to be with you, James. Professor, we spoke about a month ago, and as I told you in a couple of our prior correspondences, I didn't think we'd be back to talk to you so soon, but the latest news in Venezuela brought this call upon us. So, I mean, you're a leading expert on the subject of hyperinflation, ongoing hyperinflation data. You've been an advisor to five foreign heads of state, five foreign cabinet ministers. You served on President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. You even worked firsthand with the then Venezuelan President Rafael Cadera in 1995 and 1996 before Hugo Chavez took over in 1999. I'd like to start with a larger picture here, if we could. You know, following World War II, Venezuela was one of the most prosperous nations the region had. And, you know, things began to change arguably for the worse in the 1970s and 80s. We perhaps begin with a bit on Venezuela's past and then maybe move into the present day situation. So your thoughts on Venezuela as far as post-World War II, what was that nation perhaps like? And then moving into your 1990s experience, that would probably be where we'd start. Well, they actually have one industry, and that's oil. And uh, that... that mm-hmm came on strong after World War II and, and essentially pushed everything else off to the side. I mean, the, the, the economy uh, is one in which every, everyone was living off uh, the state-owned oil company, PDVSA, and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and they have huge petroleum reserves. The oil reserves there are, are the largest known reserves in the world. But uh, mm-hmm. with very, various forms of either interventionist or socialist governments, a peculiar Venezuela style of intervention and, and socialism, the, the economy is, is basically run into the ground, and, and it's, it's now being run by what's nothing more than an organized criminal syndicate. So oil production now is is actually at a level that's lower than it was in 1947. So, <laughs> wow! Right at right after World War II, they they were producing more oil than they are right now, and and the reason for that, of course, you've had you mentioned Chavez came in '89, and and then after Chavez, 
we have had Madeira, but the 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 economic model they call it Chavismo, which is is a form of Venezuelan socialism, and and that has left the state-owned oil company, which produces over 95 percent of all the foreign exchange that's produced in Venezuela. I mean, they they don't produce any anything and sell it overseas, basically except oil. Mm-hmm. So. If you have a, a tremendous drop in the oil production and the prices are, of oil are rel- relatively weak, also you have a situation where the the government has very little revenue and and they spend like drunken sailors. I mean, it is a socialist regime where they they buy. It's a vote buying operation, basically. Mm-hmm. If, if if they need more votes, they increase the subsidies for gasoline, food, and whatnot, and mm-hmm. distribute it around, and that w- way they can garner support and, and votes. Uh, the problem is it, it leaves them with a huge hole in the budget and, and no way to finance it because they, they don't really have access. They don't have access to the international bond market anymore, mm-hmm. and the domestic bond market is, 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 is tiny and, and um uh, atrophied in any case because the the banks are full to the brim with government bonds uh, if they took on any more the all the banks would certainly be insolvent almost overnight mm-hmm. so they go to the central bank and and the central bank of, of course accommodates the government and they turn on the printing presses and extend credit to the government and 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 that gooses the money supply and once the money supply is goosed you, you have hyperinflation so today i i'm the only one who measures hyperinflation accurately and i do it every day in venezuela it's a 121,583 percent per year is the inflation rate in yeah. venezuela today on the 31st of january 2019 so it is. It is a hyper hyperinflation. They they've been hyperinflating. That's not a a high hyperinflation. Out of the fifty eight hyperinflations in world history, that that one ranks twenty three. So it's so it's down quite a quite a ways, and the and the hyperinflation rate isn't isn't too high by hyperinflation standards. But but it's very long. The duration of it is is lasted now twenty seven months. That means that there are only four hyperinflations in history that have ever lasted longer than the Venezuela hyperinflation. So it's a it's a it's a moderate hyperinflation, but it but it's a long lived yeah. hyperinflation. I would also argue that now with technology there's never been one that's more been you know, further like as far as documentation, the amount of videos, the amount of footage, the amount of coverage. I don't think there's ever been a hyperinflation with this a much uh, documentation uh, in 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 the human history, I would I would argue. Right, right, right. Yes, I, I agree. You can you can see what's going on on the ground just with these videos that are yeah. streaming out of there every day. So if you don't mind, I, I wouldn't. You know, I, I did a little bit of research. Now you obviously talked about the hundred twenty thousand percent hyperinflation that's going on because you're checking this data all the time. I think last week you said it was just over 100,000, so it's fluctuating. IMF made a really big mistake by claiming it was a million or 2.5 million. And I know that when I'm listening to journalists on this topic, if they cite that data, I know they haven't done their homework because they don't understand that IMF data was completely over-exaggerated, correct? Well, yeah, there, there's a difference between the, the number I gave you is a measurement, and and I uh, using purchasing power parity theory, you you can measure hyperinflations very very accurately, very accurately, and and that's 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 what I do, and that's what's in the scientific literature. That's what I published in the scientific literature, mm-hmm. and and what you you do, you you there's one free market price in Venezuela, and that's the exchange rate, the Bolivar dollar exchange rate. Mm-hmm. So you take that black market rate and you, you look at the changes in that black market rate over a year, for example, if you're measuring yearly inflation. And then with purchasing power parity theory, you can do a little arithmetic and, 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 and trans, translate that mm-hmm. into an implied inflation rate, which is what I do. So you, 
you can do it with very high frequency data. I mean, I could I could do it every hour. I, I could do it every minute if I wanted to, but sure. I I do it once a day. And and the then then we get to the the problem with the IMF, and the problem with the IMF is that they they measure nothing. They they've had nothing no. no no staff in Venezuela, no contact with Venezuela. They're not measuring anything. They're forecasting hyperinflation, <laughs> and and that's a, that's a no-no. You cannot forecast hyperinflation. No one no one has ever published any model that, that allows one to forecast accurately <laughs> hyperinflation. Sure. You can of course forecast. I mean, my granddaughter, who's nine years of age, could forecast the hyperinflation in Venezuela, but. But like the IMF, it, it wouldn't have any scientific basis. It would, wouldn't have any reliability, accuracy. Yeah. Their 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 forecast, therefore, for last year, the end of the year, they said the inflation rate would be two thousand two million five hundred thousand percent, and and they made that forecast in October. That that was pretty close to the end of the year, mm-hmm. December thirty first. The actual number. That I measured on December 31st was 80,000 right, percent yeah. per year. <laughs> so, so it's 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 a, a, absolutely a, a, a disgrace and, and stupidity that they even publish the thing. <laughs> but the conclusion is why why does this make a difference? Well, it makes a difference because it, of course the journalists have no idea what's going on. I mean, they, they don't know how to measure or anything. They, they but. You have a big institution like the IMF publishing it. The journalists repeat it, yeah. and and then on top of it, to add insult to injury, most of the journalists, uh, since the IMF said it, it must be true. <laughs> Correct. And 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 they get very mixed up. The, the, even the journalists don't. They won't say this is a forecast. Often they say that's the rate. Yeah. They they imply that that's the rate that the the, the IMF measured. Well, they didn't measure anything. Yeah. So. The press is is, uh, is 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 it's my 95 percent rule. 95 percent of whatever you read in the financial press is either wrong or irrelevant. Mm-hmm. And and in this case, it's, there's no question about it with with the hyperinflation. Very few. I just did a, a tweet uh, this morning. The Economist magazine came out this morning with a statement saying that the inflation rate was 1,700,000% in Venezuela. Yeah. Well, I just told you it's it's 121,583%. Right. So the economist gets it wrong and and what they've done, they've taken somebody's forecast and they they reported it as if it's a measurement. So we ba- so we basically have misinformation compounding essentially, and every time every time I see it, then I know oh well they, I can't trust that that outfit because they're not doing real journalism at all. Like nobody's actually digging in the weeds here. I mean it's it's right. it's amazing. Well, they're in in a way you see here's here's the problem with this thing, uh, James. You, they're they're reporting actually what what if if they say it's a forecast if if the journalist says that it's the IMF forecast that that is an accurate statement <laughs> the the point is they don't they don't get to the fact that oh they're th- that's a forecast it's not a measurement and if you actually want to measure and find out really what's going on you got you got to in this case come to me but so there's there's confusion about that and and then and then there's another kind of confusion and that and that is where the journalist d- doesn't accurately report that the IMF is producing a forecast. They they uh, they they will say or imply that the IMF number is a is a is a measurement. Now that is a, an error. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So so the first uh, the first one is, is, is there, it, 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 it isn't the full story. I mean they 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 could run you know fifteen forecasts out there and so forth. And if they put them all in, that, that's fine. That's true. But but. It, it, there's there's an error of omission, not an error of commission. The 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 error of commission is is where they report the IMF forecast as if it's a measurement. The error of omission is where they report the forecast and say it's a forecast, but they they omit the actual measurement that's being done, which it, it turns out I'm the only one doing it. Yeah. 
so professor i don't i hope you don't mind but i'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, your experience in 1995 and 1996 in venezuela i found um you know something that you had sent me uh, went deep in the weeds here and it looked like uh you had a, an interesting experience in your time down there. Would you mind giving uh, some of the listeners just, you know, perhaps your experience advising President Caldera in 1995 and 1996, perhaps maybe what you what you learned from that that uh, experience? Uh, the, the first thing is all, all these currency reforms that I've been involved in, I, I usually write a book about it, uh, be, uh, laying out the, the game plan be, before things begin. I, I did that with Caldera. Uh, Dr. Kurt Schuler and I wrote a book in Spanish, public, nice publication. It's it's subsequently been revised, and, and the second edition is available in Caracas. Uh, and, and, and in that book, uh, we lay out the, the game plan for the introduction of a currency board in Venezuela. Caldera was attracted to this because he, he sensed that there was there was no fiscal discipline in, in the system. He really couldn't control it, uh, and, and he also knew that the, the the currency was vulnerable and unstable, a bolivar. So so he 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 wanted to fix that. Uh, he 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 knew that I had successfully done some currency boards and and uh, stabilized countries and disciplined their fiscal affairs. So he invited me to be his advisor. I wrote this book with Schuler, and and what the currency board is, and that's what I'm proposing now again in, in Venezuela, is the, the the Bolivar would with the currency board would have been made a clone of the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar would have been the anchor currency in the system, and so the Bolivar would have been issued, uh, but it could only be issued if there was a hundred percent U.S. dollar reserve backing for each Bolivar that was being issued, and then the Bolivar would trade at a, at a fixed exchange rate with the U.S. dollar and be freely convertible uh, into the U.S. dollar, and and in that way that. That local currency, in fact, becomes a clone of the dollar. It's it's exactly the same as the dollar because if you don't like the bolivar, you take it in and exchange it for U.S. dollars freely without without any restrictions, with with no with no no uh, markup or anything like that. It's just a free exchange with and and it's equivalent the bolivar and, and the mm-hmm. dollar. Yeah, but that professor, that would require some fiscal stimulus, and as well, giving away a little bit of your sovereignty over your monetary system. Well, no, correct? Not, not really. You don't give up anything because you can change your monetary system anytime you want to. That's the beauty of a currency board, or or you can get rid of it if you want to, or and also you you, you can get rid of the anchor if you don't like the dollar. You can you can switch to gold or the euro or something else. So. So you have complete control over it. what you uh, what you don't have. Uh, you have control over the cu- currency board regime itself. What you don't have control of, you have no discretionary monetary policy because the, the, the quantity of bolivars that would be circulating would be a, strictly a function of the demand for the bolivar. If you draw a supply and demand uh, diagram. Uh, and put a quadrant on a piece of paper. The, the supply curve under a currency board for the supply curve for the local currency it is a completely elastic horizontal supply curve that runs across the, the quadrant at the fixed exchange rate at the Bolivar dollar exchange rate, and and then you put a draw demand curve, a negatively sloped demand curve, on that quadrant, and and that demand curve moves back back and forth. And, and where you have the intersection of the perfectly elastic supply curve and the demand curve, you, you, you will get a quantity, and that's the quantity of bolivars that will be circulating in the economy. If the demand for bolivars goes way up, the, the currency board, of course, supplies it it's automatically. It's on autopilot. 
and and the supply the quantity of bolivars would do, would go up if the demand went up if the demand goes down of course the quantity goes down so it's a it's a it's a mark completely the market determines the market determines that once you set a currency board up the market determines the quantity of money that's circulating in the economy not not the governors at the central bank or the central bank staff you have no discretion at all in the system you you target the exchange rate but the, you have no policy with regard to the, the, the money supply. The market determines that. If, if you don't mind, this is kind of a sidetrack real quick, but how did Argentina get that wrong? Well, Argentina didn't have a currency board, uh, unfortunately. The, the, the Argentine, Argentine system that was put in in April of 1991 was something they called a convertibility system. And it did have a fixed exchange rate between the peso and, and the dollar, and and the, the the problem is that they had under most conditions, but there there were loopholes and variations that could occur. But in general, they at least had a minimum of a hundred percent U.S. dollar reserves. But the problem is that the the those U.S. dollar reserves uh, were on the balance sheet of the central bank, but but also domestic bonds were on, on the balance sheet. And so as a result of that, they actually let the reserves fluctuate tremendously from, from well, at one point it did actually, towards the end, it went down below 100%. This exception and loophole was used. But in general, it fluctuated above 100%, but fluctuated all over the place. And the reason that that it did that, the fluctuations occurred, is is because they were sterilizing the inflows and and outflows of foreign exchange coming into the central bank, and they could do that with the domestic assets that they had. So, so you had a huge amount of discretion going on under the convertibility system. And they put it in in April of 1991. In October, I wrote a article in the Wall Street Journal saying that they should fix all the loopholes and, and make it a currency board so so they wouldn't get into problems, which which I predicted they would get into. Well, they, they did. I mean, ten, 10 years later, the thing blew up. Sure, sure. Because, because of these loopholes and, and because the, the monetary authorities actually had discretion. And what I, what I mean by that they they were targeting the exchange rate of, uh, and leaving it at one to one, but they also had a monetary policy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With a currency board, you target the exchange rate, but you have no monetary policy. So that that's the difference. Again, tremendous confusion. Uh, uh, Dr. Kurt Schuler did a story and uh, a story, not a story, a, a actually scholarly paper an economic journal watch a few years ago where he he looked at the the hundred leading economists in the world to see how they referred to the Argentine system. And as I recall off the top of my head, I think 93% of them referred to it incorrectly as a currency board. Right. Yeah, that's not surprising. So, 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 so here, here again, it's the ninety-five percent rule yeah. coming in. You see, ninety-five percent of what you read, even even in the scholarly journals <laughs> in economics, we're not talking about newspapers. No. It, it's either wrong or or irrelevant. Yeah. that's the ninety-five percent rule, and it, and it was perfectly on display in the in this Argentine episode. Unfortunately, the, you say, well, who who cares? You know. Well, it has, it has a big impact because right now we're debating what to do if there was a new government in Venezuela to stop the hyperinflation, and I'm advocating a currency board. Well, a lot of people in Venezuela, virtually no one in Venezuela knows, knows much about these things in a, in a scientific sense. So all they know, they think Argentina had a currency board and the thing blew up. In fact, there have been over 70 currency boards, and no currency board has ever blown up. Even the one that, that, that John Maynard Keynes put in in North Russia in 1917 during the Civil War, Russian Civil War, that thing didn't blow up. Hmm. Hmm. 
it, it, it held out even 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 after the the Bolsheviks won and the, and the whites went out. The, the whites took the the currency board to London and 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 all the all the rubles in that currency board. Those currency board rubles were redeemed for gold. Mm-hmm. So, Professor, I, I don't know enough about that topic to add anything to it. So let's swing it back to present day Venezuela and get back on topic. I, I wanted to ask you, did this recent Trump administration move to declare Juan, Juan Guaido as the acting president of Venezuela? Did it surprise you? No. No, no. I know you've been at. I, I mean, the per, the personality surprised me because no one knew who the guy was. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, even though even the Venezuelans had no no idea who he was, uh, so so that that aspect is but it did surprise me. But this is a standard operating procedure. The U.S. Is, if if they they're a big imperial power, and if they don't like somebody or some regime, they they try to change the regime. So, and they've done this, of course, in Latin America and Central America, many many times in the past. So, does this current situation not play into the hands of perhaps some people on the far left, even Maduro? You know, basically asserting U.S. is the imperialist state here, doing it again. They're coming for the oil or other resources that Venezuela has in the ground. I mean, you have John Bolton literally saying this on uh, live TV on Fox, I believe. I saw a clip recently. I mean, I, it, it must help, you know, in terms of this proxy war to give them... Well, I, yeah, that's why, that's why sanctions are... Yeah. This, is, this is actually what, what's generically called a- economic war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and it's fairly clear that now it's been fu- fully engaged in by the United States. Be, before in in the in the past years when there were just selected sanctions and so forth on on Venezuela, you could say, well, maybe it wasn't a full declared war. It was a, a, a you know kind of a, a a micro thing targeted towards uh, particular criminals within the. Madeira regime, which there there are plenty of criminals. Sure. By the way, the thing is lo- loaded with them. As I said, it's really nothing more than a criminal syndicate operating, but in Venezuela now. But but you're right. Sanctions, which I'm opposed to in, 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 in every place and at all times, uh, these forms of economic warfare, I'm opposed to because they they have a history of one not not working. Not achieving their desired uh, and stated aims, and and also creating a lot of unintended uh, cons- consequences, a lot of collateral damage that people can't anticipate. It's impossible to predict. And and one thing they they always do is in, entrench the uh, targeted enemy. Mm-hmm. And, sure. And, and and Madeira, you see, unfortunately, Madeira, you know, you can't, you couldn't believe anything this guy says. Right. But there actually is one thing that he says that that, that there's he has a point, and that's the uh, 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 United States is at war with Venezuela. They they are in economic war. So that statement actually is true. Maybe it's the only, almost the only truthful thing the guy has said. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, this is, I think, a larger game of foot, right? I mean, you have China and Russia who have some interests there. Obviously, long term, I, I would imagine both have interests in Venezuela. Is this not like a larger geopolitical game going on right now? Not not merely just for Venezuela, but, you know, Western interests in the oil potentially versus Eastern interests in that in that area? Well, it it is. I mean, it, it, number one, Venezuela uh, owes China a huge chunk of money, less, less the Russians less so, but Russians have an interest in in the oil there. I, I mean, an interest in, in 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 actually ownership interest right now, uh, oh, oh, because the the oil uh, has been used as collateral. For, uh, and parts of the oil Im- empire. Now, I'm not just talking about the reserves. I'm talking about the uh, the, the companies, uh, PDVSA and, and their subsidiaries, are collateral for loans that the Russians have made to Venezuela. So, so the, the Russians have they they literally have an interest in they they loan money Venezuela. 
ponied up collateral, and and if somebody uh, takes the collateral away, uh, obviously the Russians are not going to get paid. Right. Yeah. No. It it makes sense. They would have uh, some physical collateral if the default happened that they could own, gain ownership in that oil. So it uh, makes sense that they would so, be averse. So, so the the argument going around is that is that uh, uh, Madeira is illegitimate. The Venezuelan government's illegitimate. And and so a lot of this debt taken on it is what they call odious debt. There, there's a theory about this, and if it's if it's odious debt, uh, that that means that that it, that it wouldn't theoretically it wouldn't be a liability of of any new government that came in that was legitimate. Right. It wouldn't be the it wouldn't be the liability of a legitimate government. Let's put it that way, okay. because it was in, in, entered into by an illegitimate government. Mm-hmm. But that that that's a that's a a, a, a hairy and and a complicated legal thing, and it's it's shall we say it's a legal theory rather than a legal practice. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah, I know that that makes sense. The question is who has control of the actual area with force. Um, obviously, Maduro has been siphoning billions and billions of dollars out of the oil company in order to pay off his military henchmen to, to keep him in power. The question, I suppose, is when you look out, say, the next few months or the next year, do you see this getting worse as far as, you know, coming to violence at some point? Well, that, that, that's hard to predict. I, uh, it, it, it's, it's becoming a, a more sticky wicket than it was a week or two ago. Let's put it that sure. way. It's, 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 the, the whole thing has been ramped up uh, enormously. And, uh, Do you have any insights on what Colombia and Brazil are thinking? Well, they're uh, they're taking the side of the U.S. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah, I mean, with a, a million or two of, of recent migrants into their country, it, it yeah, would make yeah, sense well, that they, they yeah, there there have yeah. been two and a half million uh, mm-hmm. Venezuelans that have that have left because of economic hardship and conditions and as well as general repression and the and the crushing of freedom and general liberties and either people are starving or they're afraid one of the two or or they don't have a job three so so there there has been a a, a huge emigration and and the, the the bulk of those people are in uh, Colombia, which which has disrupted Colombia tremendously. Right. Yeah. So on on a larger scale, let's swing it back to the USA, if we could, for this final question. Um, you know, socialism. I think you and I would both agree historically is inferior even to constrained capitalism that we've had in our in, in the Western world um, regarding economic output, the general population's overall well being. I think we would both favor uh, capitalism in its freest sense. Uh, are you concerned about the trend that's going on in the USA with growing socialist political trends? I mean, what what are you thinking about that in terms of in the years to come? Well, it, it, it's it, it's a problem, uh, and and it's it, there's been erosion in the United States, and it really doesn't matter what what political party we've had. There has been tremendous erosion. It, it fluctuates around a little bit, but the the trend has been one of of losing economic liberty in in the United States, so so 